things to have more support. Yeah, is, is to get things out of the one domain and think about it in a way and then think about it in multiple sources. So, uh, Great, thank you, Martin. Um, also, just like to thank uh, Bob and the organisers for um, getting in contact and inviting me here. It's been really interesting, actually. It is out of my comfort zone, so it was really interesting. Particularly, I was in the session the 10 minute plus two, so that session yesterday, and there's some really interesting things on segmentation and some discussion afterwards in the coffee break. And so, yeah, thanks for inviting me for talk to talk, but also it's been really good to talk to people here and network as well, and for Martin for kind of joining us up as well, so, so thank you. Um, this is a kind of long talk after lunch, so if you drift in and out, then, then that's fine. <laughs> you need to close your eyes for a little bit. I've been in conferences all summer, and so I know what it's like the, the post-lunch slump, so, so hopefully some spinning images and visualizations will help to keep you awake. Um, so that's mainly what I'm going to talk about, is, is how... I'm a user, I'm certainly not an expert, that's why coming to a conference like this and sitting in the talks, it's, it's um, a challenge for me, I don't have that expertise, I'm kind of adjacent to that and we know that we need to work together, but, um, so I'm going to give this talk as a user of graphics, visualization and data um, very much and, and what the developments are that I see and what they potentially could be in future, but I have no capability to action those whatsoever. I can think about things that would be really useful for our field, but I, I do not have those skills, and so reaching out to, to these types of communities is important. Um, important to list the people, and I try and put the names up as we go through the slides of everyone who's kind of contributed to the different sections in this talk. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, based in Swansea University, over on our second campus, which is just down the road. Um, it's engineering and business, and computing campus in future as well. So. Um, Hopefully we'll try and link these things up a bit more in future. Um, and so I, I lead an imaging facility. We're called the Advanced Imaging of Materials Facility and Research Group. And our tagline to help us get the money to set up from, from the funding agency was from atoms to applications. So we have capability, we have microscopy, to image things from atoms right up to large scale applications working with Rolls-Royce, Tata Steel and, and engineering companies. So this is what we do. We, and even though I'm not at a microscopy conference, it's still important to show we get data, because ultimately we produce data from different machines at different length scales and different modalities. So we can look at things in the optical domain, uh, one meter and above. We can go through micro scale, micro to nano. FibSEM, which is an electron microscope, destructive, um, but we can image things down to the micro nano scale. And then TEM, which is transition, transmission electron microscope, and that's where at the highest resolution we can, we can observe atoms and the chemistry around those atoms and how um, the building blocks of materials can, can change under different conditions, effectively looking at structure, property, relationships in materials. And to set up that type of thing, we had to have lots of partners, so it was really important to reach out and to see ourselves as enabling. So we just run microscopes. It's other people that we collaborate with, have the brilliant applications or the challenges that we can help to solve. So here's some of our techniques, imaging and characterization, but we very much work closely with industry and materials engineering. So we try and look at problems both in the scientific domain, but also engineering and how we can, can solve problems in the real world and lead to kind of impact on the scale of three to four years if we're lucky. That's how long things can take. Um, and we also link into STFC, the um, Science and um, Technology Facilities Council. So we link into things like Diamond Light Source and ISIS, Neutron and Muon Source. So we have our lab-based equipment to generate data, and then we reach out to other places to generate even more complex and larger data sets to try and deal with. Um, if anyone hasn't been over there, this is effectively where we sit. And this is, could be seen as a boring slide. Uh, it's going to do something now. Um, but it's quite rare to have all of these different techniques within the same um, building, in the same block. A lot of the time you're trying to find an electron microscope in one part of campus or one research group and then an extra microscope is usually across campus or at very best across a hallway and it's run by someone else and you have to manage those relationships. So we're rare in that you can come to us with a particular challenge, a problem, material and we can look at it in all of those length scales and 
different domains. So this is mainly what we operate and we're expanding and we're already out of space. As always happens when you build a new campus, you plan for six years ago and then you have more people and more things, more toys to play with. The next things we're going to go through really quickly. So the message from all of these is that we can generate data. That's all we do, data in different forms. And then it's how we deal with that. And we have to reach out and look at different software solutions to be able to deal with the data in different forms. So light microscopy, there's many different forms of light microscopy, different machines, different file types, um, where we try and standardize across those and use software that can deal with them all. This is a bit of a glossy slide. It was used in a brochure, but effectively, this is our digital classroom. So each one of these light microscopes is connected. And so the students in the undergraduate courses can save so many images, uh, more than uh, they could in the past. So it's good to have this connected microscopy suite, which is quite rare. Um, it's good for teaching because any student can pull up on the iPad the view down the microscope of anyone else's microscope in that lab. So it's great to be connected, but then we have challenges of uh, data flow and data um, storage and what people do with that. You know, you can almost, by creating the ease of this, then people will just save more and more um, without thinking potentially about the quality of that. So that's one of the messages we're trying to get across to, to users. And we bring industry in and, and they work on these microscopes as well. Electron microscope. Looking at the same thing, just at a higher resolution and in different modalities, and we can generate lots of data on there. And we have about 150 users who will come through on that machine. Um, we can generate different modalities of data set within an electron microscope. This is a slightly different one, but visualization starts to become more important. It isn't just about seeing the thing you're seeing. Every image is data, I know that, but light like microscope compared to an SEM is just different imaging modality and once you start looking at interpreting something from a structure or um, the x-ray spectra that you get off that material then it's about it's more important to think about how that is visualized. I'll focus mostly on this talk on the data that we get from x-ray microtomography, x-ray CT. So these two machines they work uh, complementary, one is ICE, one's Nikon, so there are challenges in, in um, different data architectures between the two, but effectively it's CT data, slice data, is what most people can understand and work with. Um, Crossbeam um, is a destructive SEM, where we create 3D data sets through destructive slicing, like a microtome, but with a focused beam of ions that removes a couple of nanometers of material, and then you reveal the material underneath, do the same again while imaging, and that gives you your destructive 3D stack. Um, and the TEM, the Transmission Electron Microscope. So this is where we're looking at atoms within a material. Less important for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, we also can do things within our microscope, so we can apply loads and break things. That I'm a material scientist at heart, so that's really what I like to do, is break things and try and understand why they broke. Um, just I use microscopes more and more to do that. So these are tiny, tiny diamond tips that we use to deform material and try and understand how it behaves. But then there are lots of potential challenges with how we visualize that. Um, not just how we visualize it, but how you make it um, understandable to, to different audiences. And that's part of the aim when we're actually trying to visualize data, is, is what are we doing? We're communicating it. So all of that stuff, all that enables me to do is just work with lots of different people and work across different research domains and, and do exciting things, really. That's what I like to do. So all of these types of research projects have been enabled by having that equipment. But that brings up another challenge. It's, this is a whole load of people with very different expertise, and to interpret and understand our data, visualization and graphics are critical. We, we wouldn't have collaborations, many of those collaborations, without some of the glossy kind of visualizations that draw people in and help them understand, rather than just looking at the numbers or the um, columns of data that are the quantification. <laughs> So this is really what I'm going to focus on, X-ray micro CT. So we produce X-rays, they travel through our sample while we rotate it. This is what the projections will look like. And then that's reconstructed into a three-dimensional volume. <coughs> and this is what it can look like afterwards. So this is from CT data, it's a leaf cutter ant. And we can focus just on the head to give us a higher resolution. And this visualization software is my favorite, and I will come to that later. 
And we can isolate, you can just about see the, the tips of the mandibles of the leaf cutter ant are highlighted red because they have a higher x-ray attenuation that's related to um, zinc entrainment along that surface. So the zinc gives different materials properties, it's like having a tipped knife edge effectively. And we can see that within x-ray. Um, but things like this, these draw people in. You know, one ant researcher goes back to their institution with this type of visualization and then we get phone calls from people in their department who want to come and do this stuff. And this isn't the thing that you, know, you write about in the paper, it's about the interpretation and understanding of what we saw within there, but actually this is the thing that got someone interested and created a collaboration. Uh, things like this, this isn't even related to a research project. Um, this is from the museum on campus, there's a zoology museum on this campus, and so we just um, went over to look at some specimens that we could, could try out in the machine. So this is a sand dollar, it's, it's a flattened urchin effectively, um, and so we can look at the internal architecture of this. And I'm going to come back to this one a bit later. Um, but yeah, it gives us that unprecedented view of the internal architecture, and we now have projects that have come out um, looking at bio-inspiration, so looking at structures in nature, prospecting museum collections to look for structures that could be used to inspire engineering structures in things like um, wing architectures with Airbus. And you can see you know, that type of structure and those spars. Nature finds a way of producing or laying down material in an efficient way. You don't just throw a load of calcium carbonate in to make this as solid as possible with some flow channels. You actually create a structure that's that's optimized for its environment, or the least worst structure for its environment. And so, yeah, we're, we're looking into these structures for a number of research projects. To add complexity to our data, it isn't just X-ray attenuation through the structure, but we have biological structures that are soft. So staining, people will probably be um, familiar with staining of tissue for fluorescence, where we can stain for attenuation in x-ray. So all of these were stained with um, an iodine-based contrast um, medium. And so essentially we just dunk it in iodine. The iodine is absorbed by certain structures in the soft tissue, and then that means we can then see them, because otherwise we wouldn't get this type of contrast of the structures within soft tissue. This is a fish. Uh, this is a project we're looking at with Cambridge University on these little suction pads, but we want to look at the muscle behind those. And so this, we can now see all these different muscle groups underneath that suction pad. We wouldn't have been able to see that in x-ray data. This isn't just showing off because this creates a huge challenge for us in segmentation because the iodine, um, it does get taken up into different um, anatomical parts, so muscle, fat, tendon, nerves, to different amounts, but it's still very difficult to segment. Um, and so that's one of our biggest challenges at the moment is segmenting stained sample. The, the sand dollar was easy, it's just calcium carbonate and air, so segmentation problem, it's, it's really simple thresholding. Something like this where you have lots of different biological architectures, all of these different intricate shapes, you don't really care much about this, or if we did that would be great because it's a different gray scale, but all of these different um, muscles in different directions, we want to be able to segment them separately, but they all show up as the same color. So we're looking for interfaces and things like that. Earth Sciences Geo, this can be a real challenge when you have um, materials of similar density to try and pull those apart. So segmentation has traditionally been a challenge with some Earth Science samples. So this is a core sample um, from a marine environment. That's where people go out on boats, drive a drain pipe into the sediment at the bottom, pull it back up, and then we image that within the X-ray machine. And so the white visualized here is actually volcanic ash. So when you get a volcanic eruption, volcanic ash goes into the atmosphere, travels quite far actually, and then is deposited over the ocean or over lakes and gradually drifts down to the bottom. And so we can date volcanic events based on their position vertically within those core sediments. But also this, actually, we've just put a grant proposal in with someone in New Zealand on this, where this actually is the feature of interest. So when they saw this, they'd never seen that before. So this imaging enabled that, but not just the imaging, the visualization actually was the thing that enabled that collaboration. And these are little air pockets as well, which they'd never really seen in 2D, in 2D uh, cuts through the core. So this indicates potential um, earthquake events, which are really important in New Zealand to try and understand those and their effects on the um, kind of dormant earth structures. 
So that's what this potentially related to uh, an earthquake event after deposition. Um, we looked at co collaborating with people on insect morphology. Uh, again, this is stained material. This is different software used for visualization, which I will come to again later. But this enables us to see, this is the uh, past the eye structure and the brain structure, which is um, really nice to see in this, uh, in this organism. But we did a study on different staining, uh, different fixing agents. So if you have something that's live tissue, uh, soft tissue, we need to fix it so it doesn't degrade and then stain it afterwards. So this was a project working with someone who'd seen some of our visualizations before and wanted to look at the effect of different fixatives and shrinkage. I am an engineer and I used to work a lot with aerospace and so this is an aerospace material um, used in jet engines and this is kind of flashy and very fast so hopefully no one gets motion sickness but this path is actually important, this is a gas path and so when you have a jet engine you want to be able to contain um, the gas within um, certain regions because if it escapes around the blades then actually you lose efficiency of the engine so you want to maintain the gas path so if there's a, all of these small pores for, for the gas to pass through this material around the blades, then actually you lose efficiency. And so trying to understand the uh, interconnected porosity, or whether it's isolated porosity, is, is really important. And so this travel through helped to visualize that. We could just say, oh, there were two or three pores in this segment that passed through, but actually to travel through the porosity gave um, those engineers a greater understanding. You know, it, they were the gas at that point passing through. Um, and then this is a more recent one, um, I wasn't sure what time this talk would be after lunch, but this is coffee effectively. Um, does anyone recognise what it might be? It's an internal scan of something, so it's a region of interest within. Pardon? Is it a No, no. A group? Oh, what, sorry? Coffee group. Uh, uh, what's a group? Coffee group. Oh, no, um, it's a coffee pod, so it's a bit more modern than that. So this is um, working with a coffee company, and there's a lot of technology that goes into those coffee pods, um, because you're adding pressure on one side, and then you have all of these coffee granules below, and so to try and understand the fluid flow from one end to the other, and, and how that um, how this makeup changes as, as you go through the minute or 90 seconds of filtration of of fluid through those granules, you'll get a change in um, organization of the larger and smaller grains. And so we're trying to understand that at the moment, and that feels like the project that's going to have most impact, right? If we can improve <laughs> coffee, then at least we've done some good in the world. Um, so yeah, still haven't got a coffee machine off them though. Um, so we should have that. And then archaeology. So this is really um, nice to talk about because if anyone, I did close these blinds, but if you can see out that window, that building across there is the Egypt Centre, and that's our Egyptology Museum on campus. And again, this was, I went over there knowing I just had an x-ray machine and that they'd probably have some cool things to look at. And this is a long-term research project because it's one of those side projects. Um, and there's a paper that I just need to finally finish, but there's a lot of research that we've done um, on scanning their mummified animals. So, um, these are around 2,000 years old. They look like a bundle of rags. You saw just before this was digitally unwrapped, it actually looked like a cat, but many occasions those wrappings that might look like an animal contain nothing, or they might contain one individual bone, whereas this actually is, is a really good example where it contains, um, it definitely contains a cat. Um, but we did, this is a strange one, we still haven't published, but because these visualizations got out, we did, um, a horizon program on this and so this is unpublished research but because the visual the visualization drew the BBC in to, to want to talk about that project um, and we've learned a lot of things and that actually our collaborator on the paper only came about because of the BBC program because we we just done these visualizations and then I was kind of looking for someone to, to help us understand what the bones mean and so they they've already been talking to someone in Leicester University and so they're now our collaborator on the paper and you can trace this all the way back to the visualization. The visualization was the communication tool that led to these discussions that other people are having outside of our group, and then they come back and, and want to want to work with us. And it's driven that work. Actually, it's quite a powerful piece of work now. So we've done lots of visualizations of the cat, 3D prints, and, and things like that, but all to help us understand 
what we're looking at. So visualizations, when we're collaborating with an expert on animal bones across the country, the visualization becomes so important. So we want it to be accurate, but we want it to be, it's hard to get it usable because they're not able to manipulate 3D data. So I have to create some kind of output that they're able to analyze accurately. Uh, and so for this, the interesting features we could see were damage to the skull, so I wanted them to look at that and try and interpret whether it was damage that happened pre or post death. So was it in 2,000 years after this animal died, when it was in storage or, or whatever it was happening at the time, or was it before or during the point of death, which is a really important part of the story, if we can look at that and find out when that happened. So some of the damage we can definitely say is is in the 2,000 years since death because of the types of fractures we see on the skull and then other damage could potentially be the cause of death. So, so this imaging and the visualization has, has enabled us to learn a lot about the life, the death and the <coughs> preservation of these, these mummified animals. And so we could isolate digitally um, unwrap and then look at regions of interest to get high resolution scans of this mummified cat. And we can see huge amounts of damage to the jaw, so the jaw is fractured. Um, and this was one of the challenges we were working remotely, so the, the expert potentially aged the cat from, from images, but then when I was delving through the data, and when you do region of interest scans, you could generate a lot of data on an individual sample. Um, I started to notice that the teeth were interesting. You know, when you're aging something, the teeth, the, the dental distance is one of the um, metrics that you'd use to age. But then I noticed these unerupted teeth just under, and you wouldn't really see them from the, from the other visualizations. It was slice data that gave me that, and I had the slice data, and I was the person manipulating that in all three orientations. And so I segmented out the teeth, and so this indicates a much younger cat than we initially thought, because the teeth are unerupted, so this could be a cat up to around six weeks old. And there was a talk yesterday on segmenting of teeth, and so I did this manually, which was <laughs> horrific. Uh, <laughs> uh, they look the same as the bone, pretty much, apart from uh, the enamel. Um, and so, yeah, it's a bit sketchy, some of the segmentation, but it was enough to show that there were unerupted, smaller teeth of a, of a kitten, effectively. And when we looked at the neck, it looked like there was indications of strangulation, um, so we potentially have an age and a hypothesis for a cause of death. I'm always wary of saying a cause of death, um, but it could be. So why do we do all this? Why do we do the imaging? Um, because we want to understand materials or structures or dead cats um, and phenomena in nature. So if it's to do with loading materials, heating, cooling, things like that, then we want to understand those phenomena where people don't have an understanding. So filling those gaps. But also we want to communicate we don't just do things we want to communicate, and that can be an academic paper, a conference, a public talk, wherever it is, but visualization helps us massively in all of those, whether it's to an academic audience or to a public audience. <coughs> also is to provide context, so we can have an understanding, and the visualization might be kind of peripheral and to the side. It might actually not make it anywhere near the academic, paper, but for in talks, the visualizations provide context for people, it helps people understand, it allows people to dip in and out of a talk, because I know that, I, especially a long talk like this, you just can't focus for that entire time, and if you can just, you know, if a visualization pops up and it just kind of rejigs where you were in the, the whole kind of ebb and flow of a talk, then it can help provide context. And it can provide revelation, so it can reveal things. So this was an image by Sarah Aldridge. She submitted it to Researchers Art, which is a competition I run, and some of the winners from previous years are on the building outside. Um, but this is a brilliant image of bone. So this is wrist bone. This is what your wrist bone will look like internally. And you've seen that, right? You've seen x-rays or CT data of wrist bones loads of times. But what she's done in the software and the visualization side of this, that's what she, in a conference in... Um, this week, Martin was actually won the Image Award because it's just striking. It's just bone, right? Everyone works with bone a lot of the time. It's not the most exciting of materials. I think it's pretty awesome, but you, people are used to seeing it. But the visualization on this makes it pop. It, you get lost in that trabeculae. You know, I, I, I need a picture of this on my wall because I just 
I see a different thing every time I look at it, and it's the visualization that does that. It's no different from any other data we've generated in the lab, um, but it's this particular visualization. The time Sarah spent to get this visualization was definitely worth it because it created interest in her research. And also, not all data are equal in the messaging they convey. So, some of the things I've shown you before, they help communicate with a collaborator from a different um, area of research. Or they'll help communicate within our group, or they'll help communicate in a public science event. But sometimes, actually, the underlying data has a greater message. So, this is um, an academic from Swansea University in geography. So, um, Professor Adrian Luckman. So, this is his image. Um, of movement data of a glacier. So it's just a, a, a displacement map in different colors, so a rainbow map on, uh, superimposed onto a glacier based on their remote um, tracking. But there's a message to this, and I know um, the research group want to just prevent, pre present the evidence and, and the data, but actually you know, when we, we're as scientists up against many different sources that will not be working with evidence and data, particularly on issues like climate change, then how do you make that data accessible to people when the most accessible person is the person shouting loudest? And so if you have visualizations that help show that data, then you potentially have a tool within your know, kind of repertoire for communicating that science, whereas people might not even look at you. Know, the, the paper that you've published or the data, unless it has this hook. This is the thing that actually gets people interested. So visualization helps us create a common language. So we're communicating, that's ultimately what we all want to do, and it's in different forms, but we turn data into something that people can digest, understand, and that enables conversation. We could just be using it to start a conversation. It doesn't have to tell the whole story either. So we create this common language, and again, that's to different audiences, for collaborators as well as broader publics. Helps us do analysis, obviously, that's usually what people think of when they think about creating visualizations or some kind of way of representing your data in a different form. So it just helps us analyze you know, the structure of, of different words and then to do modeling within that. Um, so that's the very basis of what, what it can do, graphics and visualization. I think all these other things are um, just as valuable as the thing that goes into the paper. And again, it can get attention. So, uh, did anyone see this recently in the last couple of weeks? So this is temperature anomalies by country. The projector isn't that great, but each one of these is a different country or a different city. Uh, oh yeah, different countries or cities within countries. And so, you can see the years progressing. So this is deviation from the mean temperature in each year. <laughs> After the 80s, it starts to get very red, <laughs> effectively, at that point. And that's a really quick, you know, so that will go on Twitter, and that's a GIF that will run for 30, 25 seconds, and that's a message that, is, that gets across. It's a, it's a really, really clear visualization, and it would have taken a lot of time to develop that, and to even plan it and think about it, but it's worth it in the end, you know, if, if you can go to those lengths to, to think about the output and the audience when doing visualization. So now I'm going to delve into a couple of different things that the uh, imaging, computation, visualization communities are doing that we as users have visibility of and either use or think are great things or that we'd like to use in future and just need to get some time. Um, so this is an example. I know uh, Michael Dubey has just moved to Hong Kong, which I found out last week. Um, so he's um, creator of BoneJ, which is a plugin for ImageJ, which I'm sure everyone's... Um, it's familiar with. So the key when Michael developed BoneJ, it's a toolbox of different um, plugins that will analyze bone. Bones are really common material for 3D data sets and you just need repetitive analyses a lot of the time. Um, he wanted it to be free open source but he didn't want the analysis in a black box because that's one of the biggest problems with closed software is people can't really check the workings. A lot of the time people aren't checking the workings but to have the option and the ability to check the workings was really important. And so this is a really useful piece, a really useful piece of software and tool for doing automated analyses of bone, so trabecular thickness, um, porosity, pathways through skeletonization, um, and people can contribute to that. It's a community of people, effectively. 
So that's one that I like. Has anyone heard of Bung J? Two? Okay. And yeah, imaging people, which yeah, makes sense. Do you use it? Yeah, you use it. And you probably know a ton of people who use it as well, Martin. Yeah. The other one then is some work by um, Dr. Ann Carpenter and, and the team in the Broad Institute. So they've, they're developing open tools for bioimage analysis. Um, again, free open source quantitative analysis of biological images, because you can create tons and tons of biological images of cells, and then you need to characterize those. So automated uh, methods that are repeatable, where people can check the code, are really important. Um, cell Profiler is the current version, and they're also attaching machine learning modules to this as well. So these are just some examples. If people are, they're quite specific to the challenge, so if you're a fruit fle fly researcher or someone looking at that as a model organism, then there's a a module within that, or if you're looking at tumor growth within material and uh, different imaging modes, then it's quite useful. So, the fruit fry module will be able to isolate individual cells and clusters. The tumor module, ultimately, I haven't done this, so I don't know the process to get to that, so I'm showing it as a lovely little transition between one image and the other, but typically you know there's, there's a fair bit of work to get to these points. But the idea behind this software is that it simplifies that pipeline and makes it repeatable and you can show your workings from how you get to one to the other because ultimately you, you have your original data and then you have transforms, modifications and analyses that you apply to it and you want to be able to show that process and repeat that process. Um, then there's some nice things to do with correction which they, they've put in their software as well. So basic illumination correction, so you create um, easier edges to pick up if you're segmenting. And then they have a load of modules for C. elegans, which is a model organism, so loads of researchers are looking at that. And so just something like this, um, to untangle, so it just, it finds the edge of this pretty common shape for researchers who are looking at C. elegans worms, um, and is able to apply those. And there's loads more, they were just a couple that I thought I could show quite nicely um, in this. And I've mentioned they're now looking at some machine learning um, for segmentation and some of these other aspects as well. This is an interesting one I like to talk about. So has anyone come across Etch a Cell? No one? So this is out of the Crick. Um, this is Dr. Lucy Collison and Dr. Martin Jones. Um, and this is segmentation, but segmentation incorporating citizen science. So this is a traditional SEM image. This is the cell and this is the nucleus and this is the line between the nucleus and the rest of the cell. And a lot of the time that involves someone tracing by hand, even when applying to machine learning techniques, you still need that training data set, so it involves a person doing this. And this is just a 2D image. So they thought we could have a website, and they host it on Zooniverse, which is a citizen science type website, um, to host individual 2D images. These are usually a stack created by Blockface, um, essentially that's where you, dry, you have your sample and a sharp knife comes along, removes again a couple of nanometers of the material, you take an image, which is this, and then the knife will come along, slice more and more until you're able to build up and reconstruct into your 3D volume. Um, so the very basic thing they want to do is just divide nucleus from the rest. And so they can trace, there are some algorithms, but there, there's, there are challenges in maybe less um, defined images. And so, to create the training data, they allow the public to do that, to, to create their training data for their um, machine learning um, aspect. And so, it's effectively, people go online, you have an account, and then you trace around here, and you build up your, um, your numbers, and there's a lead table, and it shows you know, where you are in that, and, and actually, people want to do that, which is great. You know, if I was coming up with that, I'd be scared that no one would be interested. Um, and a part of that is getting the message out there as well, that's the challenge, you can have a website that no one visits, but, but they've, they've had some success with this. Um, and so yeah, they get people to do this. They have to compare to an expert, obviously, so an expert has um, worked on the same samples, uh, same images, and there's enough uh, similarity or, or the error is low enough to justify then opening it up and for that to be a real training data. Um, yeah, so that's a re I really like that example, and, and it would be amazing if I could get the whole world to segment my data set. So <laughs> that's the dream. Um, 
one we're looking at, it isn't open, it is uh, paid for software, but it's we partner with Zeiss and so we're trying to work this into our imaging pipeline because most of our equipment is Zeiss. So you go with what is likely to, as a user, that's what I need to do most of the time. I've got a backup of things that need segmenting, some that are more challenging than others, and I need a tool that works and that the people in the group are happier using. Um, and a lot of the tools, they'll require Linux. I don't have any people with any computing skills, um, like good computing skills, who have a computing background in my group. And so we, we like tools that we, are just easy. We're, we're pretty poor at looking at the back end of anything. Um, so this is IntelliSys, which is relatively new. Um, but again, it's rather than grayscale based segmentation, it's, it looks at texture as well. And it's machine learning based. I just copied these things. I don't know what they mean. Do these mean anything to you guys? <laughs> this is what it uses. So it uses open resources in uh, to, to make the software work. And so it's looking at, ultimately these are the same color. You have some brightness differences, but effectively that would be, based on its color from fluorescence imaging, that would be a difficult one to segment into the main spine in these day lights that come off. And so it's able to pick things like that. We've been using it for um, the more challenging porosity examples that we have. Usually porosity would be easy, but actually with FIB SEM data, so SEM data, that's not as straightforward. So they're just some of the, the little tools that I think are good or, or we are using. Um, the next slide talks about some challenges. So I mentioned X-ray is what really I'm focused on, and 3D data. So here's some challenges, and this was brought up earlier this week, acquisition rates for X-ray data at Synchrotron or ESRF, which is Synchrotron in Europe. You can get over a million frames per second now. And I just blows my mind in terms of the, the volume of data that that's going to collect. Is anyone ever going to be able to, to look at that? I think yeah, we were talking over lunch yesterday about you know, people with hard drives on their shelves that they're going to struggle to ever get the time to, to analyse. So automated methods are becoming more and more important. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know how you deal with that. Um, and it's usually based around 4D. So you have 3D imaging, and then you do something. The reason you want to gather so many images is because something's changing. So that's compression of material, flow through it, or temperature changes. And so 4D, even in our lab, slow imaging, 4D creates challenges with, with handling the data because you have multiple data sets you're trying to handle at the same time. Um, and segmenting. If it's a segmentation problem, then it just scales with the more scans you have of the same sample. And then multispectral is developing as well. So that means you're not just generating attenuation. So that's, you, know, you see the structure with x ray imaging, the edges of things and then the varying grayscales throughout. But multispectral means you might have chemical data overlaid with your structural data. And so that just, you, you can see for every single scan then or every single data uh, specimen, you have an ever growing um, volume of data that you to try and analyze correlate between the two data sets as well is a computing challenge. Um, so yeah, there's some of the challenges that I see for us as a imaging and tomography field going forward. And I'm going to just flag this up now. So I've got some thoughts on the future of segmentation without having any computing skills. Uh, but from a user's perspective, this is a really nice data set that I've generated recently with staining. So it's that fish sample. Some really distinct morphologies in there because it's biological. So we can see gills, we can see stomach, we can see organs, we can see muscle fiber groups. And this is a big suction pad. It's a fish that attaches to other fish essentially with a suction pad. Um, architecture's there and there. Um, but a lot of the time the grayscale overlaps or the edges aren't quite as distinct as you want them to be. So segmentation is definitely a challenge, but I'm going to come on to that particular sample later. Um, so I was talking about segmentation, but a lot of the visualizations I've shown were developed in, or were created in Drishti. Um, so this is Ajay LeMay in um, Australia, created this software. It's free, it's open source, um, does volumetric visualization. Um, it's very, very good. Within the tomography community, we, we love it for its visuals, so its shaders and lighting are amazing. Has anyone come across Drishti? You have. Okay. Do you use it? Yeah. yeah. Ah, excellent. Okay. Um, for visualization, or do you segment it in Drishti? Both. You do both? In Drishti Paint? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Drishti Paint, yeah, it's a challenging one. <laughs> I 
and is that the segment? Okay, and yeah, so I find it the best software for visualization for, for creating those almost photorealistic um, uh, visualizations, images, and videos. Um, so it's very, very good. And Agi is extremely open to to people suggesting things and and to giving help. It's just it's not his main job. He's he's got a whole other job that he works on and is trying to develop this. Um, but yeah, the visual shaders and the lighting are just incredible, so it's my favourite piece of software for developing visualisation. And I think normally these things go by the wayside. You talk about the, the software that costs us 20 grand that allows us to quantify the core volumes and do all of this characterization and quantification. They're important, but actually Drishti has probably led to the more collaborations and, and working with different people because that engagement, because people are just drawn to the images and the visualisations can do segmentation and some people in the group are, uh, will go to that. Everyone goes to different software really. Some will go to Drishti to segment. I, I can't go near it for segmentation. It's challenging. It's tricky. Uh, you have to spend time but yeah, I've, I've not been using it. And another thing, Drishti, recognizing that these outputs are highly visual, um, have developed Drishti Prayog, which is an interactive touchscreen version of their software stripped down, it's usually created from your output. So once you've done a lot of work in Drishti, you've, you've, you've um, modified your transfer functions, you've maybe done some segmentation, Drishti Prayog is where you can then, in a slightly different version of the software, have the public interacting with it. Or when I say the public, every, anyone who isn't yourself is the public, um, usually. So they're publics. So anyone who hasn't worked on that data can come and play with that data without changing anything, um, but also it's a communication tool. So you can get this you know, a background to the data and then you move into it and it allows people to, you know, with touchscreen, remove that example that I just showed of the shrew. That's not what the specimen looked like when I scanned it. It had skin, flesh, eyes, all of those things. But you could have that within the transfer function that with a swipe on Prayog, you remove all that soft tissue and then reveal the bones. You have to kind of do a little work beforehand um, to have those segmented, but effectively, um, that's what a few places are using this. We did it a little bit, we didn't create a lovely stand, but you can imagine how that would work in museums and science festivals where you just have a computer and a touch screen all within one stand, stand and people can kind of interact with it. It's a little buggy, but again, that's, you know, Andrew's developing this on his own, whereas the other version of this, the tabletop, you know, as big as this and on a flat version is incredibly expensive, paid for version from a different company. Um, and ultimately they're doing the same thing, it's just ease of use is slightly better with the really expensive version, but I think you know, Agile can get there with this. And it's public facing, used in museums. Um, so we've used that a little bit and it's a really good way of visualising it. It can work on kind of global scale data, um, weather forecasting maps, GIS data, all the way to our microstructure of the inside of an ant head. Maybe. Um, it's very good with 3D data. So I'm just going to talk about another project that um, we've worked on. So this is visualization, but slightly different. This is photogrammetry. Um, and this was a project called Virtual Tudors, and it's still ongoing. Um, Nick Owen is the lead on this. Sarah Aldridge, you can see in the video, um, is a PhD student. She's just got a postdoc in Lincoln to X-ray. Um, Katie did um, like jumping insects because they have um, their hearing mechanisms on their knees. So she's imaging those things now. But she was she used to image 500-year-old um, human remains um, for her PhD. And so she's doing photogrammetry on this. And a lot of photogrammetry or digitization can be about, oh, we need a digital copy of something. But actually, this was a research project. So the images and the visualizations need to be good enough for primary research. So the main idea of this was the Mary Rose, uh, does it, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll do a quick explanation. So this was a, um, King Henry VIII's, um, one of his warships. Um, it sank just off the coast of Portsmouth, a couple of hundred yards off the coast, um, and uh, killing hundreds of people on board. Um, but the, the geography in Portsmouth is quite um, unique in that so the ship sank and it was, it's near an estuary and so there's a lot of silt that comes down the river and goes into the, the ocean near that part. So the ship sank, loads of people went down with the ship and then they've, 
the skeletal remains are incredibly well preserved because they go into the, they're covered in silt. It's an anaerobic atmosphere, and so there's very little attack on the bones. So the bones, some of them, can look you know, almost modern, apart from a bit of discoloration. Um, and so lots of people want to look at these bones because they're a, um, essentially a, a timestamp from that period of a particular population, people who would have been on board, so soldiers and cooks and things like that, and they're all men. But it's a, a population to be studied, and so many people want to look at those bones for various different projects. But they're, they're unique and incredibly delicate, and so you can't have everyone coming and looking at them. You can't send them around the world, which people would like. And so this was a project about doing photogrammetry to characterize certain aspects. It's not, you know, this can only cover the external parts of the bone um, and capture things like um, surface topography and color and texture. Um, but the key was the imaging needed to be really good. And so we created a resource because this is still a trial, we created some, some um, really time-consuming photogrammetry um, scans and we put them up on a website and just wanted to see how people interacted with them. We held the skulls in a hidden part of the website because there are some um, sensitivities around having human remains on display and the skull is a particularly um, emotive part of human remains. So we had one skull that was visible because we knew we needed something to to get people you know, to get that um, impact really, so people would even be aware of this. And then 10 skulls in the background that people could email if they were from a research institution and had an osteological background, so they could look at those and run through a quick, um, <laughs> say quick, a relatively quick um, questionnaire that was based on can you ID certain aspects from this virtual skull. And we had some ground truth because we had some osteologists look at the real skulls in Oxford and so we had some, these questionnaires were filled in by people who had access to the real, the virtual, and then people who had access to just the virtual online as well. Um, and so this has been really good for, for gauging how different audiences engage with those. So we had those people who would apply and, and come and do some analyses, but also it became incredibly popular. One, because it was timed with a press conference, which is always helpful when you're trying to get the word out there. Um, and they're also interactive, so there's, there's a, another reason for people to come and look. So we hosted, the ones that were visible to, to the public um, were hosted on Sketchfab, um, which is a really good medium for photogrammetry data and allows manipulation, allows annotation. Um, and you can just kind of, on this projector, it's not a great on my screen. It still looks pretty good, actually, on this projector. So there's the quality of the photogrammetry work that Sarah did. Um, yeah, so you can do measurements, you know, overall measurements, and there'll be a certain error with photogrammetry compared to laser, compared to x-ray. But actually a lot of the features are looking at texture or things like this, you know, looking for an abscess or cratering in the skull. And so there's a lot of analysis that can be done on the virtual. And there was always this um, perceived idea that, oh, you know, the virtual is, is pointless having, we can't do meaningful analyses on, on those. And that's what we're still looking at. Um, through the data for those 10 skulls to see, you know, if we can show that it actually it is useful for a number of measures. Some things you just need the real skull, but, you know, you either have nothing or something. It seems a bit of a, it's not black and white. You can do certain things based on vi virtual resources. So in addition to the research side, the engagement was remarkable. So it reached millions of people, one because of the news aspect. On the day that the embargo lifted, Alex Hildred, was on Radio 4, chatting to John Humphreys in the morning. Nick was on Radio Wales, chatting to them. Sarah had done an interview with the BBC for their online, and then I was doing BBC World TV all on the same day, which was really good because underlying this, we wanted to get people to do the research side and, and look at those 10 skulls, because the more people who did that, then the more robust our data would be. Um, so we were really pleased with that. Um, but then on Sketchfab, it's a nice way of seeing how your model compares to some others. So in cultural heritage and history, we've got six models on there. The skull and the shoe are the top two still. I, I looked last night, so they sit uh, slots one and two in cultural heritage with... Ah, you can't see. I can look on mine. 1.8 million, no, 1.6 million skull. The shoe's got 1.3 million views, and then the third one, whoever's... I don't know, ruin of a house that is, 
and it's got 600,000. So they sit way up there on cultural heritage. And the press helped drive that and helped drive participants for our study. So it supported the research, all of this. Um, and then I only checked last night because I thought, let's see how well they're doing in all of Sketchfab. So people are aware of Sketchfab, right? Ooh, okay. I would check it out if you haven't. It's an amazing resource. So 3D models that you can manipulate, move around, study. There's people who've done segmentations on there as well. So and they're annotated. People spent huge amounts of time in creating Sketchfab models. And then overall on Sketchfab, I had to create a longer one, but we're down here, which is still really good because most things are um, computer graphics. So people have drawn most of these things from models. So this is the only real or something based on photogrammetry data or a scan or laser scan or, or x-ray. So all the others are drawings of cars and planes and you know, beautiful as they are. But it's, you know, it's good that we've managed to jump into that with some real research and imaging data. And that's testament. So Sarah is really behind the quality of those. I think if the quality wasn't there, then there wouldn't be that interest. So the visualization, just having the thing isn't good enough. It needs to be really good quality. So people are so there's a wow factor. People do feel like they have the artifact in front of them. Um, and so now I'm kind of veering into engagement. So there was a research side of this, but also there was engagement and comments around that that we can engage with and discuss with people. Um, so we also have created a virtual museum. Uh, so this is um, within Unity. It's a rough building architecture. And we showcase our 3D research data. It's mostly from X-ray. There's some photogrammetry and some laser in there, but it's mostly CT data. Um, and people can, in VR, walk through our museum, interact with the exhibit so they can pick them up, move them, um, resize them. But I don't know if that was switched on for the video. Um, it's expandable, so we can just add um, data to it. This kind of sits at the end of our workflow, so we do everything. And then this virtual museum is, we have to go in back into our data and create a specific output for this because we have to simplify the volumetric data. It needs to be just surface data for the VR to be able to handle it and reduce number of faces to quite a low number for it to be able to be held within VR. Um, so within here we can reveal the invisible, that's what we kind of say within this museum. So it is different to other museums where it's not just the artifact, you can actually see inside them and put your head inside them. Um, and scale, we remove the limitation of scale, you know, you can go in there and, and put your head inside, inside the bone that we looked at or ride on top of a hoverfly, you know, and, and walk in the walls of a couple bone maze. It's removing that scale and you can engage with things of varying sizes uh, in different ways. So we've run this at the British Science Festival, Swansea Science Festival, and industry actually really um, quite like it. So you put that headset on someone who's come to ask you to image their very specific industry, you know, how to make the lid of this better or something, and actually they're interested in, in what you're doing. It's slightly more than just talking to them about what a microscope could do. So again, the visualization helps um, generate interest in the broad story. Um, and so yeah, again, I did a quick, like literally a virtual run through of the museum, um, which is a bit but I can explain where we are. We're in the main lobby and there's a gigantic sycamore seed in the center. I'm jumping into one of the other annexes now. So that's how we split up the, the data. Otherwise, it would have to render a lot of models and videos at once. So we have dividing walls where you can walk into the different um, rooms. This is all based on uh, .stl files or .ply for most of these um, models. And then we can add information about the model, we can have the videos, these gigantic visualizations on the wall as well, um, around that, and then people can pick these up. So this is the mummified cat skull, I can move it around. Then I can go inside the cat skull and see what it would be like to look through the cat's <laughs> eye sockets. Um, and then we're going to jump to another, wherever I'm going. Oh yeah, so, and this is early research, some of these things. There's a mouse knee, and then we can put our head inside that mouse knee and look at the trabeculae, because people might never have. <laughs> Very rarely people have. Over here then we have three different data sets. It's bone, skin and feathers for a, um, a house martin. And the feather model is based on photogrammetry data. Here we have a maze, if you're building a museum, it's fun to walk around a maze. So this is based on cuttle bone data that's been scaled up. So this is about half millimeter square 
uh, cube of cuddle bone and we've made it as big as, it's, it's actually bigger than the museum. When you go out to the museum, you can see it sticking out of the roof. Um, and you can get, I, I, get, I got lost in there. Um, couldn't find my way out. Um, took a while. As you can see, there we go. Which is quite cool, walking around that. And, and actually, when I first did that, I saw new things that I hadn't seen in the cuttle bone structure as well. So creating this output at the end of our workflow, I then saw holes and, and beams within that microstructure that I just wouldn't have been able to look at before. I used the um, analogy that a CT data set can be as big as Grand Theft Auto, the computer game. And people spend months wandering around the city in Grand Theft Auto, and it's the same with CT data. Once you get into it, actually, you see new things, and you could spend ages wandering around and get kind of lost. Now, this is the uh, joint of a woodlouse. There's the ant head again, where we can, I think I move it around. Sorry, it's a bit, it's quite fast, because I literally was running around. I wondered how fast I could see everything in the museum. Uh, but we can add to this as we generate more data and, and edit the resources and, and think about you know, improving it really. This is very, this was our starting point for a, a way of showcasing some of our data in the museum. Oh, here's, a, here's the sand dollar. So it's like the Millennium Dome in London. You can, it's, it's nearly as big and you can walk inside to show the video and then encourage people to go and wander inside. And this one you do get kind of lost. The data doesn't, you know, if this was the volumetric data, it would look so much better. So this is simplified surface, but it serves a purpose at the moment until we can find a way of doing volumetric. We're in the mouth parts of the, the sand dollar at the moment. And once you go in here, it's kind of symmetrical around, so it's hard to find your way out. I think we've been in there long enough. I'll skip that. Okay, so I mentioned volumetric, so that is a resource that sits at the end of our workflow. We have to create a surface file to be able to look at it. Recently, um, we've started using a piece of software called SciGlass, which is, allows volumetric VR. And this has changed everything for us. Um, it's just remarkable. So we're actually able to look at those 3D structures in our VR. It's nothing different to what we've been looking at on the screen, but actually how we engage with the data, it's, it's hugely different. Just the user experience for us as people who are looking for things in those structures has changed massively. And so this is that ant head that we're now, you know, it, this is a video that I created within that software as well. It's, it's incredibly easy to create these videos in the software because you're in it, you're like an actual camera person. You, you put your headset somewhere and you click and that's where the next frame will be and you move it and, and it'll create an arc between them. So for me, this is going to help our communication definitely, but also I think the key difference, it'll change our workflow. So at the moment, workflow or pipeline, whatever you want to call it for imaging, we capture, and there's a million things in here that can affect the capture and the quality, but I'm not going to go into those. Reconstruction, again, there are very different reconstruction algorithms um, that can affect the quality of your data. We might process the slice data to try and remove noise and beam hardening and things like that. Then there's this bit, this very, very time-consuming part sometimes on some specimens, the segmentation, and then we get to the visualization. And sometimes the visualization is of the volumetric, or sometimes it's creating this secondary output that surface files for, for um, outreach. So that's the bit where I think there's huge potential for us as a field to change. There's lots of people doing stuff in here. There are loads of people doing stuff in here as well. But when you hear microscopists at conferences talk about Almost jokingly, oh, that was you know the PhD student spent three weeks segmenting that sample. Um, yet we're talking about image capture reducing a scan time by ten minutes, and there's all talk on that. This is where I think you know, the people, the people doing something, that's the wasted resource here. Um, having a PhD student spend weeks segmenting a data set is just not acceptable. It's not funny to talk about in a conference as though it's like a badge of honour that your group spends huge amounts of time doing that. So I think that's where. For us as a field, that's where we can benefit. Not on everything, some things are easy, but more and more segmentation, either of complex data sets or massive multiple 4D data sets. And automating that is going to be where we can benefit as a field. But also, I think that can be helped by moving visualization to a part of the segmentation. Um, so rather than just looking at slice data, you consider the whole. So this is. This isn't a glossy video from that VR software, this is actually um, a headset mirroring um, recording. It doesn't look that great on the screen. But effectively, 
You know, just here's that fish sample that I said, you know, this is potentially one of the most challenging ones for us to segment because it's got lots of cool architectures and muscle fibers that we want to segment. But now this is looking at it in volumetric and in VR. So there's the gills, you can see the gills, you can see some muscle fibers. You can actually see where they go, you know, where the muscle fibers lead to. I would just go into the gills. There's the gut. Um, when we talk about tagging things or creating your learning data set for VR, and it's always on these 2D slices. But if you can do that within the 3D, then you're tagging multiple slices in one go at that point with a, some kind of reference within that. Um, and I think that's potentially where we could, could move forward where within VR you get this, this holistic view of the whole organism, of the whole sample, of the whole material, and you can tag across what is effectively multiple slices at that point and then use those parts as your learning data set for multiple samples, potentially. Um, so I think, yeah, and here's an example of um, tilt brush. So this is within Vive. Oh, you, it's one of the Vive's first examples within Steam. So this is where artists use tilt brush to draw, essentially a paint in 3D, and they create amazing things. There's some really good examples. But effectively, this looks like someone doing um, the first stages of manual segmentation where you, you mm -hmm. paint a few things. To me, that's what I was seeing, but in 3D. And so if you can marry those two things somehow, so you have your volumetric visualization with your tilt brush tagging and, and coloring different regions, then, yeah, there's probably a million reasons why that won't work. I don't know, but, um, for me, that would be the dream. Then, moving on to citizen science, if you can get anyone with a headset to start doing this, the first thing that makes you think, why would people do that, right? People aren't going to go inside your data and start tagging the muscle fibers of an ant head for you. But then, this is a game in VR. There's a man in his boxer shorts. He's graffitiing in VR, and there's a game. So people will, will pay money to, to spray paint things and color things in. Um, and we'll make videos of it with like 10 million subscribers on their channel. So there, are, there probably are people who'd want to help with your segmentation problems. Um, why even engage um, machine learning, I guess? Just give them every slice or every data set, maybe if there's enough people, I don't know. But yeah, that's, this is a, almost like a kind of wild idea, but less. You know, that's where I think after going and being a user inside different bits of software, I'd like those two things joined up. I think that could be potentially really good. Um, and then finish, I've just got one of our visualization examples which I show in both kind of public talks but also I show at microscopy conferences and, and it's a bit jolting for people because it's just a visualization and I don't talk and there's music. But I think visualization and music working together can actually reveal, I don't know, you just get lost in your data. So I'm going to shut up now and just...
Okay, and that's the end. And acknowledgements are really important. I didn't manage to get pictures of everyone dragged in, but I've mentioned nearly everyone, I hope. That last video was done by Dougal McDonald, I think it's worth saying, because he was a intern that worked for us over the summer. Um, and we had tons of lab-based jobs we could have been doing, but I put him onto visualization and creating things like that, because there's value in it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions and comments and wishes? What was, what was that last one, That was Cuttlebone. Yeah, so the, like the maze, but just volumetric data. Very little processing of the data. It was visual, it was drishti, so it, it makes it look nice. Yeah, it's a good biometric, but it seems that it's essentially 2D. I wouldn't have known that until I saw your yeah. walk through. <laughs> Frustrating. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> very nice talk, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, a two quick questions. So yeah. one is more um, quick about uh, the, the skull that your students scan. So what, uh, what software did you use? Because you say you usually use the sort of uh, software which already does it, you know. That you don't develop your own software. So what software did you use for that? For visualization? No, for the, did you do a reconstruction of the Oh, software? reconstruction, yeah. yes. We use the, we've got two different scanners that produce different types of data. So it's from pictures, right? It's a photogrammetric approach? Oh, for the photogrammetry. Yeah. So photogrammetry was Agisoft. Uh -huh, okay. Is that one you're familiar with? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a quite a common one. Um, yeah. It was quite good. I mean, yeah, the, the construction was really good. Yeah. yeah, so there was a lot of work. So not just the capture was, you plan all these things. So the capture was very controlled and lighting. Yeah. And then the masking took a long time. And then the reconstruction Ran and like then overnight. kind of getting the, all those you know concave areas to the yes. under so it. So it was. Um, this is Sarah's work, and Sarah developed this. I know lots of people doing photogrammetry, but she knew she was looking at skulls and other bones to develop something that would work with getting into the kind of nasal cavities and the eye sockets. So it was rotations at multiple heights, at different angles, uh, three different angles, I think, um, to try and get into those areas. And I. I remember if she did some individual photos of the areas that she knew would be challenging as well to stitch in. Yeah. Oh, just from my information, so to scan one object, how long did it need to uh, in terms of man hours? Um, so, so it took, hours yeah, uh, person hours was per object about one to three hours for image, for capture, and then the masking a day, potentially, and then reconstruction depending on the computational power, but ran overnight on hours. Uh -huh. yeah. So, so it was on the order of 100 images taken? Or no, thousands. Thousands? Okay. Yeah, thousands. Yeah, and the, the, it was a very um, specific camera as well. It was a loan from Sigma. Um, it was very flat focused, and there's some other um, specifics on that camera that made it good for photogrammetry rather than just having so we had one camera, multiple locations, rather than the other set, which is lots of cheaper cameras, and you can do quicker imaging then. Yeah. I have another question, but maybe I give somebody else an opportunity when I come back. Oh. I have a question. Have you ever thought about using Amazon Mechanical Turk no. for any of your like crowdsourcing efforts? I haven't heard of it, so that's not Okay, easy. okay. So in, in right now, it's a very hot trend in the visualization community to okay. outsource user studies okay. uh, to using Amazon Mechanical Turk so you, you pay you know a few pence yeah. for every task or every user study or something that that somebody completes on Mechanical Turk and basically it, it outsources tasks manual tasks to to Asia oh, okay. and, and it gets you know still People in, in, in China and India will do tasks for very cheap, you know, uh, labor for very, very cheap. Um, yeah, and it's, it's very, very hot right now in the Viz community. I don't know if there are any other communities where it's a hot topic, but... And, and so you, we can do things that we couldn't do before. So we can have a user study run. You can, you can set up a user study on Mechanical Turk. It used to take weeks. Yeah. 
but you can have your results in the morning, like all the user studies done overnight okay. using Mechanical Turk with 100 participants or 200 participants very, very quickly and very, very cheap. You know? So things um, like segmentation fitting into that? Yeah, yeah that, that would be a very interesting experiment mm -hmm. to see, you know, to pay people to do segmentation. I think Google uses it for optical character recognition tasks okay. and things like that. If you can scan in documents that, that don't really work for optical character recognition and, and crowdsource the, the translations and things like that. And yeah, it could be an interesting <coughs> experiment to, to uh, people factor that in cost of that into a grant, you know, three. you need this amount to... <laughs> well, it's it's a very low amount of money, so, yeah. you, you know... Okay. Um, yeah. It's interesting, I'll look at, yeah, how might... It might be something right interesting mm -hmm. to Yeah, definitely, at. thank you. I just want to go back to this, your column oh, we were talking about, just want to make a comment on the mechanical turning sheets. Uh, it's a great tool, and I know many people use it also for segmentation. But it's more for the training purposes uh, and less for getting the results because you know you don't really control, you don't, don't have a very good control over the quality. The, yeah, the, the quality and also the um, population that you sample, right? But for training, it's perfect. Yeah. Like I wouldn't yeah. use it for validation uh, formally, but for training, it's fantastic. But there's a slight different one in the Kuala we have that one. We got, uh, when it was half term, some 10 year olds came in and did some segmentation. Oh, yes. exactly. We thought primary <laughs> schools were perfect. Is that <laughs> <laughs> cool? um, There was an ethics fact uh, using the whole of a primary school for getting your research project done. As long as they get all the shit. Yeah, they, they know how to draw languages and things like that. They're quite good for a while. <laughs> they got distracted. Uh, yes. there, are, there are imperfect strategies to handle that, though. So you, you give, if you're setting up a user study, you, you, you have a few test questions that flag, is this a real okay. user taking it seriously, or is it just somebody clicking and doing random things to get the money? Mm. So you have like a, a, a short test, a sanity test, yeah. that, you know, fill, classifies all your users into like normal versus insane or whatever. Um, and you choose the, the insane yeah. ones. <laughs> it's motivation for citizen science. Usually it's someone who wants to do it and wants to do it well with citizen science, most of them, because you know, they That's aren't true. getting paid, but That's they, true. They, yeah. they have an interest in the research. And, yeah. 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 I've got a sort of a general question. A lot of your visualizations had movement of the objects and yeah. fly through lots and lots of motion to compensate for the 2D. Yeah. And yet that frustrates somebody who's wanting to do science on that particular object. Yeah, they might have an aha moment, yeah. but they can't put a ruler on it or something like that. And I sort of heard from what you were saying, the beginnings of, of where this goes next, with you give you give your researcher a VR tool so they can drive themselves to where they want to be in that yeah. particular object, and they're not frustrated by it. Yeah, I see there, these there are various protocols in medical imaging for, for doing it, for exporting a 3D object essentially to a to a radiologist or a doctor, and they can then do their own driving. And yeah, they can put a ruler on it, and they can do all these sorts of things. Yeah, it's always a chat. Like we collaborate with tons of people, and a lot of them end up coming back into our lab to use the computers and the software, yeah. Um, yeah. which is fine. You know, that's because yeah. to be honest, that's the best method because they're the expert. If you're segmenting out parts of a fish anatomy, then actually they know best what is likely to be inside. They've just never seen it like that before. So the, particularly with the more challenging ones, even with the machine learning stuff, we usually work in partnership with the person. Um, and this is like, if we produce an academic paper, that's not the best thing to reach different audiences. And I see that the same with visualization. Um, some things for different, you know, we create multiple outputs, multiple resources. These are yeah, I still show these at microscopy conferences, but they know people know that there's underlying data there and there's sliced data, and if they have the software, they can they can deal with that if they want. It's just you know, most talks are just your typical images that you expect and are a standard image or the standard software. Whereas I think you can capture imagination and then bring people back to that data, those who want it or want that interaction. Um, the VR software I showed at the end, they're creating a web-based version, so we can put our data somewhere and people who haven't paid for that software can use their own headset and navigate through our kind of um, walled data sets where we've set the, the um, 
thresholds and the, the um, lighting and things beforehand. So that will actually be quite useful because you can do measurements in that software as well. Which, when you think about, most people are doing um, landmark measurements in biology based on either the actual thing or if it's not the actual, you know, that you can put calipers on. It's quite difficult to measure things in three-dimensional space. You can put a little point here and there, but it was the angle between them at the widest point, and there are some algorithms that can do that. Whereas in VR, you just go up, you know the anatomy, and you stick it one, the first point there, and you move along, and you put your next point there, and, and it measures. So, yeah, I think it can be quite useful. It's not a gimmick. It's definitely not a gimmick VR within microscopy. So, yeah. For this very interesting presentation, um, you had a, a scam from the cat, the mama cat, at the yes. beginning. Um, did you know how high resolution of the, the image was and what the raster between the X-rays? Um, so we would quote um, pixel size or voxel size for micro CT, so I can um, not remember it. I think I scanned it about six years ago, okay. um, and it's still one of those ones waiting to get out. But yeah, it's I can't remember. The head is about. Well, the skull actually is about that big. Um, I'll have to try and work back for what the likely voxel size is, but it would be a rough guess right now. Yeah, sorry. It's in the metadata. <laughs> <laughs> and now that uh, you're going to be joining Computer Science all in one happy building, it'll be a fruitful yeah, place to yeah, actually be in yeah. and collaborate and sort things out. So it shows the future forward and yeah. get these software problems solved. Some yeah, we'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll solve all of his problems. Yeah, we're, yeah, super close. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. we'll be good. Yeah, yeah. Right. five months. Well, thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I ran over slightly, but no yeah. at all. Thank you. All the speakers for all the meetings. <laughs>